you're like a main character in a sci-fi movie right now. <laughs> you're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. Your hosts today, it's me, Marissa Lowe, joined by John Perno Fisher. Hello. Elliot Carter. Hello. Rick Berber here. Hello. And our guest today is Ben Fernando from the University of Oxford. Hello. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? Yes, not too bad, thank you. Enjoying a bit of quiet time out on Mars. (laughs) <laughs> very good very good amazing <laughs> thank you for joining us um connection seems good there's no lag weirdly <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we uh, <laughs> mars and earth are quite close at the moment so it's not too bad <laughs> excellent um yes so we brought you on today to talk about a few different things um so mostly nasa's insight mission uh, which mm-hmm. i believe you're a member of the team for um so yeah would you mind telling us a bit about the mission what your involvement has been and yeah any background information yeah of course more than happy to and, and thanks for inviting me along today it's great to be with you so as marissa mentioned i'm on the science team for nasa's insight mission and insight is primarily a seismology mission designed to study the interior of mars so on earth when we have earthquakes we can use the waves that those earthquakes produce to probe the interior structure of the planet, for example, to look at the differences between the crust and the mantle, to look at the transition between the inner core and the outer core. And on Mars, the idea is that we can use seismology to do exactly the same thing, so to probe the interior structure of Mars. But obviously, we're coming from a starting point that's very much behind on Mars. We know far less about what it's like inside than we do um, for the Earth. So InSight has been a long time coming, actually. The last attempt to, or the last seismometer that managed to land on Mars successfully was in 1976 on the Viking spacecraft. So between then and InSight landing in 2018, it was a a reasonably large gap, you might say, of 42 years. But uh, it's the first time that we've actually successfully deployed a seismometer on another planet that's detected a seismic event there. So it's been tried on the moon before, but but never successfully on Mars or indeed on Venus. So my role within the team, I'm just a graduate student, a humble, lowly undergrad slaving away at my PC, Um, but it's been really good fun. So basically working um, within one of the themes on the mission. So what I've been mostly doing is working with the impacts theme groups. So the impacts group are interested in trying to detect the seismic signatures that come from asteroids, meteorites hitting the ground, producing craters and then exciting seismic waves which travel through the planet. And those are particularly interesting because you can constrain the timing and location of an impact crater forming from orbit, which means that you can get an independent measurement of when and where it happened and of course how big it was which you can't do with a Mars quake. So we detect them from InSight, but we don't know independent of those measurements where they came from, how big they were, when exactly they happened. So it makes it harder to say, use those Mars quakes to study the interior structure of the planet. um, How did you end up on the team? Was that like a pre thing of your of your course? Or? Not at all. Um, I ended. I started my PhD working on something completely different. So helioseismology, studying the vibrations of the sun, mm. and um, the Insight team did a blind test. So analyzing data from Mars is quite challenging because you can't use any of the tricks that you would use on Earth, like triangulating with hundreds or thousands of seismic stations. So in order to sort of train people to be able to analyze the data, they created a blind test. So a year's worth of data, synthetic data, which was noise with you know, synthetic seismograms inserted in random places. And they asked people to figure out when and where they'd come from. So that's how I got started as I led the Oxford team on the blind test. So looking at the synthetic data and trying to pick out you know, events, how big they were, so on and so forth blind so not knowing what was in there Mm -hmm. and um, from there it became obvious that you know we weren't particularly good at identifying and locating events on Mars so um, I I kept working on sort of developing new modeling methods for that which I've brought to the the wider science team since. Um, So thinking about how we can use 
um, seismology to sort of understand the structure of a planet. What other information do we have about Mars's interior structure? So in terms of actual information directly about the interior itself, there's comparatively little. From orbit, you can measure things like the moment of inertia of the planet. You can measure the rotation rate. Of course, you know how much it weighs. From that, you can infer some of the interior structure. So it was known that the core of Mars, part of the core is probably still liquid. Mm -hmm. But it's not like on Earth where you've got really sophisticated geodynamic models of how the interior is behaving. And obviously you can apply those to Mars, but we don't have the sort of observations you'd want to validate them against on Mars the same way that you would on Earth. And of course, on Earth, a lot of the, um, a lot of the sort of background in the 19th, 20th century of understanding where the Earth came from, came about from observing things on the surface that we could see that were clearly hinting at an active interior, you know, volcanoes, earthquakes, that sort of thing. On Mars, where you don't have those observable things that you can see through a telescope or from Mars orbit, it's much harder to work out what the interior of the planet looks like. Mm. Yeah, I suppose we have a good idea as to what each of the rocky bodies sort of looks like, but I guess a lot of these missions are more aiming to, to quantify some of these things, you know, how thick is the crust and what is exactly. some finer detail about all of that. Um, so what are some of the different instruments that InSight has been using to study Mars? So InSight has four, four, four instruments. Um, the one that I work on is the seismometer size. So part of that was actually built in London and tested in Oxford, and the other half is, is French. And then in addition to the seismometer, there's the mole, so HP cubed, the heat probe, which was trying to burrow down into the surface to measure the thermal flux. Unfortunately, um, I think the team gave up on mole recovery efforts over the weekend, so they just weren't able to penetrate the mole far enough down into the surface to, 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 to fulfill the primary mission objectives on that. Um, and then in addition to that, there's two auxiliary sort of instruments. One is uh, wind and pressure suite, so it's basically a set of sensors that measure things like the temperature, the wind speed, the pressure, which are important for removing those signals from seismic measurements. And then there's also a, a radio experiment. So you can do radio science to determine, for example, um, you measure the travel time between Earth and Mars or between Mars and the relay spacecraft around Mars. And you can use that to do things like, as I talked about earlier, measuring the moment of inertia of the planet and so on and so forth, the tidal forces, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the results that are, are coming out from, I guess, particularly your part? Then? So the, the big thing was detecting the first Mars quake, which happened in 2019. So that was the first time anyone's ever detected a seismic event on another planet, which was really cool. Um, they, the team have now been able to use the seismic measurements to infer the presence of the Martian core. So they're starting to present constraints on the structure of the core from InSight. Uh, but maybe, you know, the oddest things and the most novel things have been the Mars quakes themselves that are quite different to earthquakes that we see here on Earth. And it's not entirely clear what the mechanism behind that difference is exactly. Yeah, because I guess on Earth, we think about earthquakes being driven by things like tectonics and stuff. So, I mean, presumably then these kind of processes don't really apply to Mars then. So there are tectonic events on Mars. The two biggest sort of well-localized events came from a region known as Kerberos Fossae, which is a fracture zone a few thousand kilometers away. But you're right that there are no plate tectonics on Mars anymore. Um, it doesn't look like on Earth there's, there's plates floating around and, and doing their stuff and giving rise to earthquakes. So residual tectonic stresses, cooling of the planet are one option. Um, there's obviously, they're not quakes, but there's atmospheric excitation. So the atmosphere is pretty dynamic on Mars. That, uh, creates excitations there. We thought that there would be impact events in the data set that there might be, but we haven't identified any. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there's all the surface processes. So, you know, the surface on Mars is not as active as it is on Earth, but you still have erosional processes going on. Those can give rise to signals that, you know, people have talked about sand dunes collapsing or about, um, you know, the surface heating and cooling and cracking during the um, course yeah. of the day, for example. So presumably then these must be quite sort of relatively quiet signals then to be detecting something like a sand dune collapsing. Yeah, I mean, no one's actually detected a sand dune collapsing and been able to say that's a sand dune collapsing, but they have yeah. been hypothesized that these sorts of morphology changes could yeah. be producing signals um, at InSight. Mm -hmm. All we know at the moment is that we've seen a few tectonic events that are clearly tectonic in origin. Mm -hmm. 
lots of other events which don't have a clear and discernible point of origin or time of origin, and then lots of atmospheric noise as well. Yeah. So I guess um, I guess Mars is a lot smaller than obviously the Earth. So does that does that have an impact in terms of your ability to detect like fine up smaller events and quieter events? Um, not really, to be honest, because Mars is the seismometers on Earth are normally coupled very well into the, the, the ground. So they'll be placed underground on concrete slabs. So that they're very sensitive to vibrations. Insight seismometers just sitting on the surface. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, it's quite difficult to detect events there because it's both heating and cooling through the course of the day, mm -hmm. which causes the instrument to expand and contract, but also just shaking in the wind. Yeah. How, how big are the events that get detected compared to say like a big earthquake on earth? Uh, the vast majority you probably wouldn't notice if, if you were sitting on earth and one that size happened. That's really cool though. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how lucky were you to detect an event then? I mean, are, are people, do people think these sort of events happen pretty frequently um, or are they? So there's a couple hundred events in the catalog so far, oh, okay. uh, a few hundred events. And that suggests they happen reasonably frequently. Yeah. But the really good, high quality ones, which it's possible to determine a time and a location for as well, mm -hmm. are, are much, much rarer. Mm. Um, and is that to do with the magnitude of the event? Yeah, so it both depends on the magnitude of the event and how far away it happened. So mm -hmm. the signals obviously get weaker the further they propagate. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were saying before how on Earth you can find the location of an earthquake using triangulation, say, between mm -hmm. several different stations. How do you do that on Mars, then, if you're just using mm -hmm. the one station? Yeah, that's a really good question. So on Earth, it's possible just because if you work out the travel time between lots of different stations, you can kind of draw circles around each station and where those circles overlap is roughly where your earthquake happened. On Mars, there's a few different tricks you can do. So we generally split the problem into two parts. So one is determining azimuth and one is determining distance. So that's what direction it came from and how far away it came from. The challenge is that all, both of those parameters are not just dependent on the earthquake or the Mars quake or where it happened, but also on the structure of the planet. So for example, if you don't know the structure exactly, if you increase the velocity of the P waves in the crust in your model by 10%, that will change your distance estimate for the earthquake by 10% as well, or wow. something like that. It's pretty linear. Um, so, you know, disentangling distance and azimuth from these events is quite tricky. So there's a few different things you can do. For distance, one sort of very common way, both on Earth and Mars, is to measure the travel time difference between the P wave and the S wave. So if you know that you know, the P wave, say, propagates at, let's say, six kilometers a second, and the S wave propagates at three kilometers per second, for every second that the, that the waves have traveled to you for, the distance between the two, sorry, every three kilometers that they've traveled, you know, you'll get a difference that's corresponding to that mm -hmm. difference in speed. So if you measure the difference in time, you can ex extrapolate that to a, distance in, a difference in distance. Mm -hmm. So you figure out how far away this event happened. For working out the azimuth, what you can do is you can mm. use the um, polarization or the, uh, or should I say not the polarization, the orientation of the P wave when it arrives at the sensor to determine where it came from. So the P wave is a pressure wave. It's just like an acoustic wave in the air. It's a longitudinal wave, which means the wave the, the particles move backwards and forwards. So if your station's here and your receiver's here, the, the P waves, you know, the particles do this as they're exposed to the pressure wave. Yeah. So what that means is you know that the energy on your P wave is in this plane here, i.e. you can tell which plane it's oscillating in between the source and the receiver. Mm -hmm. It won't be oscillating out of the plane of the source and the receiver. So what that means is if you have your source and your, um, if, uh, your receiver, so that's insight and the Mars quake, you can tell which of the three directions you won't see any energy from the P wave in. And once you've done that, it lets you point towards where the wave came from. It, it's quite hard to visualize, but um, in effect, you basically record the motion of the ground by the P wave, and that will give you a plane. And from that, you can tell which direction the energy has come at you from. Uh, yeah, when we're talking about, uh, sorry. Well. Uh, when we talk about direction, uh, 
are we talking about and we're talking in a, a 3d plane aren't we we're still talking about you could be going the z direction so elevation or depth as well um, as yeah. yeah so it's those that those measurements will often not even tell you which direction necessarily they'll tell you which direction along a line so the okay. line around around a sphere is a great circle yes, um, yes. and they will point towards it Obviously, if the event is deeper, that will also change things as well. Mm -hmm. So on Earth, you know, deep events don't have surface waves. They don't excite surface waves. So you can, for example, look at the surface waves to tell you information about the depth and the distance. On Mars, we don't see any surface waves associated with the Mars quake. So it's a bit more challenging to make some of those measurements. Um, but you're right. It's not only that you've got to work out the distance and the um, azimuth. You've also got to work out how deep the event was that happened. So that's another parameter that you have to sort of add into the mix. Sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> it's um, a complicated set of calculations. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, sorry, go on, Marissa, go on. Um, I was gonna ask, how do you test these instruments then um, on Earth? You know, how do you know how well they're gonna work when you plot them on Mars? So testing them on Earth is actually a little challenging just because obviously the, um, the, you know, the environment is different, but also the surface gravity on Mars is substantially different to Earth as well. Um, so they were tested in a vacuum chamber in Oxford, the, the short period seismometers, the ones that were built in the UK. So you use that to check for things like performance, like the noise levels on the instrument. In terms of then sort of testing them once they've been put on, you can do that once they're attached to the instrument and then some of them were actually turned on during the cruise phase between the Earth and Mars. So that kind of tells you what the noise of the instrument is, because in space, mm -hmm. the only excitation that's coming about is from the spacecraft itself. So, you know, if something comes on and creates an electrical signal, you might see that. If one of the thrusters fires, it will shift the spacecraft trajectory slightly and you'll see that as well. Um, those sort of that's how the instruments were tested and then obviously on Mars there was a commissioning period when the seismometers were taken off the deck of the spacecraft and placed onto the floor and during that they were tested as well. That's pretty cool. So I guess in, in your actual research then have you focused specifically on a couple of seismic events or does everyone on the team sort of have a, a more holistic so view on, on there's everything? a pretty sort of um, strict pipeline for how the data is processed so there's a Mars quake service team who look at all the data as it comes down and analyze that. And then within the team, people have their own specialisms. Mm -hmm. So what I've been working on at the moment is looking at the potential signals from the Mars 2020 spacecraft. So this is the Perseverance Lover, rover, mm -hmm. um, which is gonna land on Mars next month. In fact, exactly a month today. And I've been looking at whether there's any chance that um, uh, InSight might detect those signals from Perseverance landing. Well, that'd be really cool. Yeah, it would. It would be very cool. <laughs> Does it look promising then, do you think? Uh, it's we possible. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's certain that we'll see it or anything, but at the upper end of our sort of estimates for detectability, um, it's it's possible that we will do that, which would be really cool because it'll be the only event we've had so far where we know both how far away it was mm -hmm. and yeah. um, when exactly it occurred. Yeah, that's a good point. So that's actually, that's actually a really important data point then, I guess, to have. It is, yeah. So that's why there's so much interest in doing this because it's not the sort of data point that you can get in any other way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I hope how, that works out then. Yeah. How close is the landing site? It's quite a long way away. It's about three and a half thousand kilometers. <laughs> but um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. The only the th only reason that we have a hope of detecting it is that we know exactly when it's going to happen. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Amazing. So you're just going to scour that part of the like. Spectrum data, yeah, exactly. So I actually just um, I've written the configuration file for the configuration sort of request, and it'll be discussed this week. And then what will happen is that um, the spacecraft will be uploaded a particular set of commands, and in that we've instructed it, or I'm hoping that we'll instruct it to turn the height, the seismometer into the highest sampling mode for about six hours just after the landing to see if we detect any of the waves coming from that. Really cool though. So that's that, that, that must be such an amazing feeling that you, you know you've gone from sort of proposing, listening to something to actually you know then carrying on through and you're actually you're actually doing something with the rover like manual. So that's sorry, I've completely garbled that question. <laughs> you're, you're right, it is very cool. And I was sort of sat there writing my configuration request, and I was like, actually, this is this is pretty cool, right? Yeah, in that 
I'll write it, it gets approved by the team and then it's uplinked by the deep space network. I, I don't know which part of the deep space network, but um, it'll then be sent, I don't know what the distance is, probably about a hundred million kilometers to Mars, yeah. you know, relayed down to Insight, which will then change the way that its instruments are working in response to this request. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, really uh, cool. yeah I, I, you're like a main character in a sci-fi movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're, you're robot lander to tap. <laughs> Oh, hi, uh, Insight, just tell me when um, Perseverance lands, please, if you could, just let me know. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm hoping that it all works out. It'd be really cool if it does. But even if it doesn't, we'll have still done some useful science, made some useful measurements about um, sort of, if it if we didn't detect it, that tells us something about the signal amplitude. It was lower than some given value. So what's the sort of lifespan of Insight? How many years worth of operation are you expecting to get out of this? So I think it was just the week before last, we actually got the mission extended. Oh, great. So, um, two years, I believe, longer that the spacecraft's life has been extended for. But what will probably happen before then, so the, the, the spacecraft is solar powered mm -hmm. and there's just dust that's been building up on the solar panel right. since landing yeah. in 2018. So what will likely happen is eventually the dust will be obscuring too much sunlight to charge the batteries enough to power the spacecraft anymore. Yeah, well, that's a real shame then. I guess there's no yeah. way of teaming that then. Hmm. No, I mean, what's happened on some of the Mars exploration rovers in sort of 10 years ago or so is they saw dust devils, sort of vortices clearing off the dust. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't, we haven't seen anything oh. like that happening on InSight. People have suggested to trying to use the arm to scrape the dust off the solar panels, but of course yeah. you'd probably break the solar panel then. <laughs> um, so no, it, it doesn't look at the moment like there'll be any way to clean the dust off the solar panels. Yeah. So I guess- you just need um, to install the desk fans on the solar exactly, panels in the yeah. future. Yeah. I think one of the problems is the dust becomes electrostatically charged. Yes, that's true. And it ends mm -hmm. up sticking to the stuff on the spacecraft. Right. So it's um, not just a question of blowing it off. You have to sort of uncharge yeah. it and then, and then blow it off. <laughs> Um, but so you mentioned then you had to sort of apply for funding then for a mission extension. I guess something that our audience may not be too familiar with then how that sort of funding procedure works for these kind of missions, I guess. So, um, so, so I guess, did you have much involvement then in, in writing a case to extending um, the, the funding um, for the operation of Insight? Um, to be honest, I, I actually wrote a relatively small part of that. It's only a paragraph or so, which was just mm -hmm. in terms of what science, what we do with the extended mission, and that included um, a section on the Perseverance landing. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly the, you know, the team leadership with input from the project scientists who wrote the funding extension. Mm -hmm. But the way that it, it works for people who are interested is that the mission's joint between, you know, NASA, the Americans, and there's bits that were built in France, bits that were built in Spain and in the UK, but the mission operations are paid for by NASA by the, for the most part. So the funding extension was to them and it was to ask them to sort of give the InSight team the money required to um, you know, extend the operations for another couple of years. Yeah. Are these things more or less guaranteed then that, that while the instrument is working, you will continue to fund it? Or... So I think, you know, it's probably unlikely that they'll turn around and say, we're not going to to fund it, we're going to shut it down. But what they can do is they have a choice of how well they fund it. Right, so I see. Teams yeah. will often submit different sort of proposals, high budget, low budget, medium budget, which yep. will allow them to do different amounts of science, you know, yep. pay mm -hmm. different numbers of people to manage the data and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So I guess uh, just uh, for the listeners, I guess, John, your point is, is that if they've spent millions, if not billions on a project, it's in, it's in the hundreds of millions get, of range. Yeah, yeah, hundreds of millions. Yeah. Right. We're not going to then go, actually, we're not going to give another 100,000 for you or 200,000 for you to carry on doing it. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, I can imagine, so I've got, uh, I'm, I'm coming into work with the uh, ExoMars, I guess, 2024 mission now. Mm -hmm. And I can see extending their projects uh, is it's slightly easier in the sense of because it's a rover, you can go, well, we need to go look at this other thing or mm -hmm. we need to go over to this direction next to extend the mission. And I understand with the insight, uh, as a scientist, it's easy for me to say, I can see the point in extending it forever, you know, indefinitely because there's gonna be more Mars quakes and there's gonna be more activity that occurs to the surface. Um, but how does one go about saying that in terms like explaining that to say we need more money because we need to do further scientific research if you're not moving around the surface. 
Yeah, so I think the, the thing to bear in mind is that because, as you say, it's a stationary mission, the focus was always going to be on monitoring. Mm -hmm. So it's about listening as closely as you can for as long as possible. Um, each day is different on Mars. So we've so far just, we've just gone through a one Martian year, so 687 Earth days. Um, but we've only had sort of one quiet part of the year. So the, the, the noise conditions vary quite dramatically with the seasons. So there's a significant advantage in extending a little bit. So two Earth years, mm -hmm. more or less a Mars year um, to try and capture another quiet, quiet season. So it's not just a sort of way you could extend for a month and do it. It's you really need to extend into the next quiet season and through that. Um, the truth is there isn't an enormous amount that has a particular date by which it needs to happen. For insight, we can't turn around and say there will be a Mars quake on this day. No. But as you say, with all of these things, building up a comprehensive picture of the inside of the planet takes time. So the longer you listen for, the more likely you are to be able to do that to some degree of success. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's quite an interesting point as well, um, the seasonality of it. I, I don't imagine we would have that on Earth in the same way, um, because ours isn't, the tectonic plates are feeling cold in winter. Um, but what, based on the data you have so far, what do you think the reasons are for the seasonality in Mars quakes? It's actually the seasonalities and the noise. Oh. So it's in how windy it is and how much the seismometer mm. is shaking. And what that does is it changes the noise floor of the instrument. So where it's very windy, you need very large events to detect anything above the noise. Mm -hmm. When it's not windy at all, you can detect much quieter events. And the, the same isn't really true on Earth, but it, it kind of is in that you, if you look at the noise very carefully, um, it's, the, the noise on Earth is generated by ocean interaction. So waves in the ocean interacting with each other and interacting with the continental shelf. On Mars, it's generated by the atmosphere. But seismic noise on Earth does show the imprint of, of the climate and the weather. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look carefully, you'll see the evidence of things like El Nino cycles in there. Um, you'll see the evidence, you know, you'll be able to track where, you know, there are big storms moving through the Pacific and the Atlantic in the seismic noise. It's just that when you have so many instruments on Earth, that doesn't actually play a particularly large role in determining whether you see things or not. However, if you're looking at very localized deployments, so one that I've used some of the data from off the coast of Madagascar, it's very obvious when a hurricane passes over, which happens during a particular point in the year, because the seismometers are much noisier on the seafloor. Yeah, that's really cool. I would never have considered that would have had such a, a major impact, really. That's, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> I had a question. Um, <laughs> um, Obviously, when there's big seismic events on Earth, you get a lot of tabloid newspapers and sensationalist sci-fi science. Um, being part of, you know, the science team that observed the first Mars quake, did you get any weird stories um, uh, from that? <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I don't really remember, but I do. I do suspect we probably did. Um, I might have to go back and have a look now that you've mentioned that and see if we did get any, but I'm sure that there were some interesting takes on it proposed by some folks. Don't worry, we've not invited you onto the podcast to talk okay. about those. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it could just be that the Martians are on holiday for part of the year, which is why it's quieter. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, yeah, Marissa's just offended that you haven't read her article, basically. Yeah, I want to get your opinion on it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> clearly the title wasn't clickbaity enough <laughs> clearly not clearly not i'm sorry i'll go have a look um, should, we, should we do a seamless transition into to ben's other work then yeah are there any other bits you want to mention about insight um i guess what might be vaguely interesting is, is you talked about the um sort of sci-fi movie Netflix, the series that they've showed in September, Away, um, they did use Insight to detect another spacecraft landing on the surface. So it was one of those cases, as often happens with Mars exploration, that mm. I think sci-fi got there first <laughs> and the science is just following up now. So I consider it's not a completely outlandish idea because if a film, film producer had the idea to do it, I mean, at least <laughs> someone less cra or more crazy than we are and thinking that it might be possible. <laughs> I hope you're citing them on your proposal. It, it, it is cited. It's quite difficult, though, because I'm not sure, like, 
in creating a, a Mendeley file, I don't know if you all use Mendeley to manage your references, but mm. how you cite a TV show, it doesn't seem to be like a commonly used category oh, in scientific papers. So um, <laughs> well. that took a bit of work actually to figure out how to, what format to put the reference in. in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, cool. Good. Uh, so Ben, last summer you were involved in a really interesting project, um, a report looking at equality and diversity in the geosciences uh, with, uh, with your university. Um, so would you mind telling us a bit about that, please? Yeah, of course. So this was a project that I and a few other grad students with a, a couple of undergrads at the university decided to do, looking at issues around the representation of students from ethnic minority backgrounds in the geosciences. So compared to most other subjects in the university or indeed the country, the geosciences is overwhelmingly under diverse in terms of ethnicity, though at least an undergraduate level, it does very well in terms of gender representation on the whole. So that, that's a little bit unusual because clearly some things have been going very well, but other things have really not worked. Whereas if you look at departments like physics, they often do reasonably well in terms of ethnicity representation, that gender is much more of a skew in terms of the people who are, who are students in the department. So what we decided to do was kind of rather than just doing something that would be seen as complaining to actually do a bit of complaining, but also a bit of solution proposing. So to have a look at what we might identify some of the issues as, to see what we could think about as to why that there was you know, good representation in one field, but clearly not in another, and to try and put together some suggestions for the university and the department as what they might like to do differently. And it, it started off as a pretty informal project. It wasn't gonna be something that was gonna be very widespread, but um, we did it and then, the department was sort of I think, a bit surprised that we'd actually gone and done it, but liked the idea. And then we sent it round to a few other people in other departments and they were even more excited that um, this could potentially be sort of replicated in other universities. So it turned out that all of a sudden we had sort of two, 200 or so people attending our launch event and listening to us talk about the report, which was really pleasing to see. So I'm most certainly not an expert in any of these things. I don't really know an enormous amount about them, but it was something that we just started working on as a side project in our department, but clearly got the traction and sort of hit a nerve as it were in the community that this is something we need to do more about, but more in terms of action rather than just more in terms of talking. And mm -hmm. it's been really pleasing to see interest from yourselves, but also others right the way through from first year undergrads, right through to heads of department and professors in in the work that we've done and talking more about it and the issues in it. I didn't realize it was such a small project to begin with. I thought it was more of a department led thing no, that then you got involved with. So that's really nice to hear, especially that it got such a good reception. Yeah, I think that was, it was probably one of the advantages in it that it, it wasn't officially sanctioned. So you know, I don't say that as, you know, it was some sort of conspiracy undercover effort to write the report. We just said, we're going to do it and, and you can take it or leave it, but we think it needs to be done. Uh, and that I think gave us a little bit of independence to be open and frank about what some of the issues were. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very much student led. I mean, we had some, some academics come along to our focus groups, but the write up and the presentation was all done exclusively by students. Mm -hmm. what, were, what are some of the key like, actions you think universities and departments need to be taking? So we divided them up into two categories, one to do with recruitment and the other to do with retention. So. I think a lot of access undergraduate efforts or outreach efforts have focused on undergraduates and on first year undergraduates in particularly. So, you know, bringing folks from college level, sixth form level through to first year university, which is good, but that's only part of the process. So there's work to be done in terms of recruitment because clearly the first year undergraduate populations in most geosciences departments are not reflective of the society and the population from which they draw their members, but also, you need to make an effort to ensure that the people, regardless of ethnicity or background, feel welcome when they arrive. And there was a few relatively simple things, I think, that could have been done to, and, and are being done now, to make you know, the university and academic environment more welcoming, in this case, to students from ethnic minority backgrounds, but I suspect a lot of the conclusions are quite transferable. And once you do that, it obviously makes the retention much easier. And you know, recruitment also applies to postgraduate students, but just as you might say, if we have terrible progression from GCSEs to A-levels, we're not gonna get the undergraduates that we want. If we don't make people feel welcome in their undergraduate degree, they're almost certainly not going to stick around for a postgraduate degree after the fact. 
Mm. This is what this is the so-called leaky pipeline, I guess, effect, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you know, any one of these issues on its own may not be insurmountable and may not lead to the in, sort of imbalances in representation that you see. But putting them all together, it means that more people you know, are put off by this, others are put off by that. And you end up after four years, when it comes to PhD applications, with a yeah. group that is not as representative of the population as when you started, because you've lost people along the way through to one of these sort of holes in the pipe, if you, if you like. And beyond too, I guess, when you get to postdoc and then lecturer exactly. type levels too, I suppose. Yeah, you're just losing people at every at every point. Sometimes for different reasons, sometimes for very similar reasons. I think actually, um, so that's good and bad in the sense it means that you need different you need targeted solutions, but also some of the solutions will address the problem as a whole, even if all you're doing is making small changes to the environment that people are working in. And you said uh, physics seems to be fairly well represented. Um, by a different uh, groups uh why, why do you think that is uh is different so i think a lot of it is to do with the sort of stereotyping and norms of people when they come to apply to undergraduate level mm -hmm. so if you're looking to study physics at university you obviously need to do a physics a level and a maths a level and you know women are very poorly represented in physics a levels compared to the grades that they might get at gcse for example so then it's not really surprising that they're underrepresented at um at sort of university level in terms of why physics has a good sort of representation so there, there's a few reasons for it and obviously you have to be careful that no one feels they're being stereotyped by it yes, yeah. but uh I guess one thing is that it's often seen as a route to financial success. And you know, if you look at degrees that have the most earning potential, physics is very much up there. So if you're from a marginalized community, you're worried about whether you're going to have a job at the end of three or four years. Geoscience says, you know, you're not, you're, you're pretty likely to get a good job, but not as likely as physics to get a very high paying job, you know, a bank or an accountant or a fund manager, whatever it might be. So if you're worried about money, that might be one reason why you'd be more pushed to doing physics than geosciences. Another thing is that, you know, everyone, at least in theory, should be learning physics at school, whereas lots of people won't really know anything about earth and planetary sciences until they get to university. Yeah. So there's another reason why people from backgrounds, which are, you know, in the UK, those who haven't been to university before, aren't sort of a uniform segment of the population. You'll see, for example, first generation immigrants overrepresented in that group, they might be more likely to stick with a subject they're familiar with because they've done it at school. So there's lots of reasons that sort of might combine to give you these biases in different subjects. It's, it's very interesting. You look at um, life sciences, for example, they have in many courses more than 50% women, but that will drop off as you move through sort of the, the echelons of academia. So unpicking it for any one particular course is, is quite challenging, but you start to see sort of common themes emerging of school age education, welcome and inclusive environment, opportunities for employment at the end and so on. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You looked at physics departments as well. Um, Obviously, there's been a lot of, say, women in STEM initiatives, um, and quite a few of them seem to have been quite successful for addressing that imbalance in the number of, say, female undergrads doing physics. Um, so I do think it is all about sort of adopting some of the same same techniques from that. Um, you know, it's not just this will fit here. And um, I think there's things from that that will be useful in this battle. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And part of what you're saying is that people have to be willing to monitor and evaluate the activities that they do. And it's okay. I think we have to be comfortable saying sometimes that hasn't had the intended you know, outcome or effect, as well as being okay to say, yes, that's done what we wanted to do. Because otherwise you end up with people just reinventing the same activity. Mm -hmm. And then it's much harder to pick the ones that work and to get rid of the ones that don't work because we're not honest and open about evaluating those activities as we go. So I think, you know, we love evaluation of things in academia, um, evaluating whether or not our outreach efforts and our access efforts are working is a crucial part of what you say, transferring these solutions from one place to another, whilst bearing in mind that one size fits all probably isn't the answer either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a question uh, and 
My question is, is do you think that, uh, yeah, so we need to, it's more about reinforcing p positives than with, I get, okay, I'm not wording this correctly. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is do you think that the reason we don't have as much diversity, especially in uh, geology and planetary science as we should do is because of negative stereotypes on the employer's side or negative stereotypes towards the job on those who we would want to get employed. I didn't I word that very well. No, but... I think you're absolutely right. It's both a mixture of the people who are in charge in the sort of discipline and the decisions they've made about admissions or course structure or, or whatnot, and also the people who are potentially applying to do it, so, you know, applying to the subject. So we decided to do our program through focus groups. So we, look, we did focus groups to try and get to the bottom of some of these issues. And it was entirely apparent that lots of people from ethnic minority backgrounds either had themselves or had known other people who'd thought about and or you know, possibly chosen or not chosen geosciences degrees. They often had very good reasons for not choosing them. So you know, they are negative stereotypes in a way, but also they make a lot of sense in the sense mm -hmm. that if you're worried about employment prospects after three years because you need to provide for your family, well, it would be a little bit you know, self-indulgent to just pick your favorite subject without any consideration of other things. It's not really a stereotype as it were, it's a, it's a balanced and rational evaluation of the evidence mm -hmm. in front of them to come to what's quite a measured conclusion. Mm -hmm. And you know, another thing was that people often talk about, oh, you know, parental pressures in Asian communities, for example. Now, of, of course those exist. I think it would be silly to pretend that they don't. Mm -hmm. But it does highlight that you can overcome some of that reluctance by targeted solutions that reach out to, you know, parents and convince them that this is a sort of safe and secure mm -hmm. degree that will lead to good employment at the end. So working to sort of undo some of those negative associations with the field rather than I think, and I'm probably guilty of this as well. Lots of us think that if we just go out and tell people about our work, that's all that's needed. And then they'll take it up and next year, the geosciences department will be a perfect reflection of the UK population as a whole. It's obviously not like that because people will come to any open day or interview with a whole host of preconceptions. And unfortunately, in the case of ethnic minorities and geosciences, many of those are negative. But I don't actually think that lots of them are particularly difficult to overcome so long as we put the effort into actually targeting them rather than just assuming if we do a talk about how wonderful Mars is and how we should all study, you know, seismology, everyone will decide that that's for them. Yeah, I feel that's a, top, uh, a conversation we've had a few times over the past few months. Um, it's not just a case of going, this exists. Exactly. And then that might work on some people, but it's obviously a lot more nuanced than that. And I think you're exactly right, because what we're wanting them to do as scientists is to take evidence, evaluate it and come to a conclusion. Lots of people have done that. The reason that they're interested in science is because they have minds that think like that. They have looked at the facts in front of them and seen very good reasons not to choose our discipline and, and gone with those reasons. So actively sort of undermining those reasons, undermining the fact that they have this preconception about the field is a really crucial part of making sure that they want to apply here. Um, I think uh, you touched um, a bit on role models. You know, if you see someone else doing that subject, does that mean you know you'll you'll want to go do it? I think a big challenge that we've been that I've been thinking about a lot is sort of how who is going to be doing all of this work for the next few generations of geoscientists. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a big challenge of there's only, there's only certain numbers of say, there's only a certain number of bends around um, to be a good role model for different um, upcoming geoscientists. And I think a big challenge is going to be trying to engage other people, you know, the people in, say, the heads of departments and so on, or your stereotypical white male geologists to do all of this. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as to how, how we can engage those people as well? Yeah, I think that's a really crucial question because part of being a role model is obviously having looking like the people you're trying to reach out to in some sense. So it's important to have a diverse set of role models. But as it stands, there just aren't you know, enough people of colour, enough women, enough people with disabilities at sort of senior levels of academia to serve as a sort of fair proportion of role models across society. 
So part of that is, I think, encouraging people who are already in senior roles, you know, they are disproportionately white mm -hmm. and male, but so be it, to do things that can make them be role models and to connect with people from backgrounds that are not their own. So one particular example that I, I would think of is obviously socioeconomic status. So that's very often correlated with other forms of disadvantage in the UK. So for example, BAME communities, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, more likely to be lower socioeconomic status than their white counterparts. If you, know, you have an academic who, who might not be a person of color, but can reach out and connect to people because say they've come from a working class background or they've come from the north of England, you know, another geographically underrepresented area, you know, trying to reach out to people on a level that works. It doesn't have to be that BAME academics reach out to BAME students. It can be about people just trying to reach out, make themselves more open, make themselves better role models for the whole community. So to give you one really specific example of how that could work, we often have academics go out into schools to talk about geosciences. And, you know, we've only got one non-white professor in our department. It's obviously completely unreasonable to expect them to take on board the responsibility for all BAME outreach. But what you can do is we look to the department marketing materials and they're predominantly people in those photos are white because they're predominantly fieldwork based projects that are showcased. And, you know, I would say that predominantly the post-grad community doing field work is disproportionately white because they disproportionately did geology undergrad degrees. Changing that up, changing the way that even a white professor will do marketing to a school group can then reach out more effectively to communities of color or communities with disability, not because the person doing it is from that community, but because you've showcased the work in such a way that it's not off-putting to them. Mm. So, you know, it's not just that going into a school is great, but if you put together a stereotype which promotes working outdoors in the cold, the mud and the rain in Scotland in January, well, okay, you've maybe enlightened 30 people as to the fact that geoscience is a group, is, exists, but you might have put half of them off even considering it at the same time. Mm. Amazing, no, thank you, Ben. And if, um, would you be happy to share some links and resources if, if people in the audience would like to read a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how that works, Marissa. I can send you the links afterward and you can put them in the description. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's we'll fine. We'll put it yeah. in the episode description. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I feel we could have talked about this for a whole episode. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's, it's extremely interesting. Uh, it can, and I'm probably guilty of this myself, it can be very tempting in academia to sort of just rail against the system for being undiverse mm. and it, it's important to not only think about why those problems exist but to make sure you're working with people to solve them rather than just being a voice of discontent because frankly mm -hmm. if all you're doing is complaining and you're not proposing any solutions my personal opinion is that's probably making the matter worse especially if you're vocal about it and exactly the people that you want to reach you know if I decided all I wanted to do was to put people off studying geosciences probably have a disproportionate reach to young school-aged BAME kids rather than mm -hmm. white kids it, it's making the problem worse as, as you say I think it's important to take the negatives with the positives and, and you know work with others in the in the community and within your department to try and arrive at a middle ground where the workload is shared and you're putting out a message that is positive but also undermining negative connotations at the same time. Oh. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I guess Not we've, uh, unfortunately, we've only got the time for the last question. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. So, Indeed. Shall, yes. Shall I, Go for it, Ricky. Shall, Goodness, shall okay. let John do it for once? John never <laughs> does the last question. Go on, John. Well, our last question that we like to, uh, to, to interrogate all our guests uh, about. So if you weren't, if you didn't pick... Um, the route of going into thinking about Martian geosciences and then insights and all the rest of it. And if, if you had to completely rethink your career, what do you think you might have gone into? So I thought a lot about whether I wanted to be a chemist or a physicist at undergrad uh, when I was applying to undergrad and I went to physics in the end. But if I hadn't done physics, I would have loved to be able to do maths, but I'm simply just not clever enough for that. So that was never really an option. Um, I think I could have been a biochemist. I don't yeah. know why. I always liked sort of drawing benzene rings. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. And there seems to be a lot of that in biochemistry. Yeah. So I think that would be my answer. Amazing. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Ben. Um, yeah, sure. Thank really you for having me. And also very inspiring. So um, we'll put the link to your Twitter um, and information about Insight and the report uh, in the episode description. That's right. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed today. Uh, I know we certainly have. So yeah, um, if you'd like any more Earth and planetary science content, um, all of our links will be on the screen now for Facebook, Instagram and Twitter um, and in the episode description. Uh, so thank you very much, Ben. And thank you, everyone, for listening at home. Bye. Bye. Bye.